I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, my talk will be centered around primarily the methods we've developed for doing time-resolved uh, experiments primarily at synchrotrons with uh, showing some of uh, the results we've obtained as examples. So as um, Arwin uh, beautifully presented in her talk, um, as we all know, uh, the motivations we have for doing time-resolved experiments is that uh, to study uh, dynamic behavior. And we all know that enzyme function is universally viewed as being intricately dependent on this behavior. So uh, we do structural dynamic analysis to gain essential information to understand these systems and eventually be able to manipulate uh, their function as well. However, the current body of knowledge that predominantly encompasses these static structures uh, with insights into their chemical mechanisms largely come from cryo uh, trapping or mutation studies, uh, primarily with classical crystallography and um, now with the emerging cryo EM techniques. So delineating the dynamics that underlie catalytic cycles of enzymes, I, the structural changes, whether or not they're small or large, uh, which are essential for the chemical transformations achieved by protein catalysts uh, as a function of time. So enzyme dynamics, take place over a wide gamut of timescales. Um, I think well over uh, 15 orders of magnitude from femtoseconds and picoseconds, which encompass bond vibrations and charge transfer to slower timescales, which is what we're interested in from microseconds to seconds, encompassing side chain motions, rigid, bod rigid body motions, as well as regulatory functions through mechanisms such as allosteric, which effectively allow for crosstalk to occur through rigid pathways giving rise to functional behavior. So for over the past half decade, um, me and a couple other uh, scientists have been involved in pioneering and developing novel tools and approaches for uh, time-resolved crystallography, where we've made uh, several seminal contributions. Now, these approaches are not only enable the elucidation of structures over a wide range of timescales, uh, whether or not you want to do these experiments at synchrotrons or uh, XFELs uh, with uh, novel data collection strategies, but also are amenable to multiple modes of reaction initiation from optical excitation to diffusion mixing. So as you saw from the previous talks, there are many emerging methods to perform uh, time-resolved experiments, and they're getting more and more refined over time. So it's now our goal as method developers to basically establish general ap applicable workflows to be able to take our um, methods and give them out to the broader crystallographic audience. And we can do this by um, fine tuning um, our setups to gain better user friendliness because as it stands right now, all time resolved experiments that are going on require specialists who are deeply ingrained in this type of science. So if we are able to move it out to the general audience, where it opens up um, our methods to new systems, we can establish new targets and gain a better understanding of enzymes as a whole. So we primarily focus on developing fixed target systems. Um, we use uh, uh, lithographically etched silicon chips, um, which depending on the chip iteration, either holds between 20 to 25,000 features. These features are reverse pyramidal shape. They have a, an opening at the bottom, um, which has a lower threshold between five to 20 microns, which can be tailored in size. Um, and this chip is housed in a chip holder, which is then housed on a three-axis positioning system, which encompasses uh, closed-loop piezo actuators, which we get them from Smaract, although there are several other companies that produce these, uh, these uh, three-axis systems now. They are relatively fast, but they are extremely accurate in their positioning, where you can get nanometer precision with them depending on how uh, fast you go. So we typically do data collection at roughly 20 to 40 hertz, which isn't as fast as um, many of the other methods. Uh, however, Robin Owens Group, our collaborators at uh, Diamond Light Source, have pushed their system to well over 100 hertz. So we typically, on average, can collect about 100,000 crystals per hour, 
But more importantly, uh, because we're dealing with a fixed target system, we know the position of every single feature on the chip in, in space. So we can always go back and re-image uh, a crystal if we want to, or do very unique uh, data collection schemes to collect unique um, types of data. So just to give you a quick video of what this all looks like, um, Robin Owens Group had this uh, video made for them, which gives a general overview of what the serial crystallographic setup looks like. We have the chip on the three axis stage. The way we predominantly load the samples onto the chip is via vacuum suction. Well, we load a slurry of crystals onto the chip and with a very gentle vacuum, the crystals are settled in. Although there's new methods now we're developing to transfer crystals uh, into the chip as well as Robin Owens Group uses uh, uh, piezo actuators to do that as well. The chip is then housed in the chip holder, which is encased in mylar to prevent dehydration. This is then magnetically mounted to the uh, three axis uh, actuators and then using different uh, rastering algorithms, the chip is then rastered in front of the beam and we collect a serial data set. And once we collect a serial data set, we can then uh, go ahead and analyze it. Now, this um, setup that I showed you is the basis of our ser serial crystallographic setup. And any time resolved experiments we do is built around this uh, current setup. So our first experiments we did was uh, simple uh, optical pump probe setup where we just had that uh, setup as you just saw and we bring in uh, a UV laser uh, beam with a, a periscope and a focusing lens to focus the laser onto the chip whereby we use the, the motion of the chip as the master clock to do the pump probe experiment. Now to demonstrate the capabilities of this time resolve setup, I want to very briefly go over a recent study we published in Science, which in my opinion is without precedent in the scope of the kind of data one can derive from a time resolved experiment if everything is carefully set up. So using a homodimeric system, fluoroacetate dehalogenase, um, which is capable of catalyzing the reaction of breaking carbon halogen bonds via an SN2 mechanism, uh, we use this system primarily because the data we can pull from studying uh, FACD as a time resolved target is very rich. It allows us to observe and understand millisecond differences in both protein dynamics as well as water dynamics, allowing us to observe and build on how ligands bind in their allosteric pockets, initiate crosstalk between the individual uh, subunits of the dimer, in particular, look at the role of water networks and enzyme regulation as and how central these water networks are in facilitating cooperative behavior between the individual subunits. So this system, like most other systems, as Deanna mentioned in her talk, is not natively photoactive. So because um, we want, uh, this was our, one of our first time resolved experiments, uh, we wanted to get it right. So we decided to collaborate with Francois Diederich's group at the ETH, and they were successfully able to use a PHP caging group to cage uh, the substrate fluoroacetate. This then rendered it catalytically inert, allowing us to either pre-soak the crystals or co-crystallize it with the caging group, thereby upon photolytic cleavage via an addition of a UV laser pump, um, release the caging group, allowing the substrate to diffuse into the active site, which allowed the reaction to proceed. So we captured a total of 18 time points, ranging from zero to roughly 30 seconds, capturing all the key steps of SN2 catalysis, from substrate binding and product formation, to covalent intermediate formation in the individual subunits, where we observed it happening sequentially over a period of time. And this was the first time a direct demonstration of half the site reactivity as a function of time was observed, but also identifying catalytic waters linking uh, the two halves of the enzyme in an allosteric pathway, which was further con uh, confirmed with further computational studies using rigidity analysis, as well as observing a global breathing motion, which correlated with substrate turnover and covalent intermediate formation. Um, so this was one of the first time resolved uh, experiments we did, but 
um, we've then learned that obtaining a cage uh, compound for certain systems, especially the one for fluoroacetate deologenase, since it contained a fluorine group, was relatively difficult. So since the majority of proteins are not photoactive, and the median turnover rates of most enzymes is roughly between 80 to 100 milliseconds. If you can get the crystals small enough, it makes doing diffusion mixing experiments completely amenable. So if it's, there's, the adage is basically, if you can do it uh, simply, then do it that way, since sometimes making a cage compound is quite tricky. Um, pushing towards doing diffusion and mixing was what we wanted to do. So we then took our serial crystallographic setup and replaced the uh, optical pump with uh, piezo uh, droplet injectors, which then allowed us to dispense uh, picoliter droplet volumes of substrate onto the individual features of the chip. And you can see here. So this allowed us to effectively do uh, diffusion mixing experiments uh, right uh, at the beamline on a fixed target. And for um, proof, of, uh, proof of principle experiments, uh, we then used lysozyme. So this was our, the very first iteration of the setup. We have, uh, again, the serial crystallographic setup, a three-axis uh, positioning system, which housed the, the piezo, actu uh, piezo uh, dispenser. And uh, the dispenser would stay fixed in space while the, the chip would be rastered um, uh, alongside it. Now, to prevent dehydration, since the open face of the chip is open, we had essentially a waterfall of uh, humidity flowing uh, over the chip. However, uh, we have since greatly modified the setup, and I'll show you uh, what that looks like in a moment. So for a proof of principle experiment, for just to observe to see if the setup worked, we used lysozyme with GlickNAC3, which is a relatively large and quite insoluble ligand. And after about uh, uh, 50 milliseconds after um, droplet ejection, we did see uh, density in the active site, which uh, uh, corresponded to the ligand, but the density here is after a full second. It's quite clear. But more importantly, uh, with this setup, the material efficiency is very good. So for a full structure, specifically with lysozyme here, we used only between 100 to 200 micrograms of protein with uh, only about one to one and a half microliters of uh, ligand that was dispensed onto the chip. So uh, to see if we could push this setup further to do time-resolved uh, experiments on it, we uh, used another model system called Xylus isomerase. Uh, which uh, converts uh, the reversible reaction from going from glucose to fructose or from fructose to glucose. Um, and it's a relatively uh, th uh, thermostable enzyme. It optimally functions between 80 to 85 degrees. We were running these experiments initially at room temperature. So its overall turnover rate becomes extremely slow. So as you can see here, we initially saw binding in the active site after about 15 milliseconds. But it was not until about a full minute later that we begun to see any dynamic shifts uh, in the enzyme. Now, this is still uh, uh, an ongoing study. Now, building on um, that initial uh, liquid ejection setup that you saw, we've begun to create uh, an environmental chamber which encompasses our entire setup, which allows not only for humidity control but as well as um, uh, temperature control as well, where we can go to very cold temperatures or to extremely hot temperatures as well. And also uh, we're developing a chopper wheel as well, which we will hopefully incorporate onto the T-Rex beamline, uh, Petra 3, which should give us uh, very short uh, uh, X-ray pulses, which should mitigate um, some radiation damage for very specific ex experiments that we do. Uh, lastly, uh, what I want to show you um, is uh, something we've uh, recently been taking advantage of with uh, uh, these newer detectors, specifically what we have at T-Rex, which is the Iger detector, which can run at uh, 750 hertz, is because the position of every feature is known on the chip, 
we know where every crystal is in time. So we can always fix the chip at a given position and take what we call a burst image uh, of uh, an individual uh, crystal upon reaction initiation. And this gives us a time resolution of about 1.35 milliseconds from frame to frame. And if we do this for an entire chip, we can uh, obtain millions of diffraction images an hour and obtain uh, s uh, s several tens of uh, data sets where we essentially have a poor man's biochemical movie since the time points from frame to frame are in the millisecond regime. And just to show you an example of what that looks like, this is the active site of uh, an enzyme which I cannot name, but you can uh, clearly see that over time, from frame to frame, there's a buildup of uh, uh, electron density. And this gives us the advantage of actually observing processes such as binding um, and bond breaking in real time. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to summarize that with these systems and with the other systems that you saw in the, in the other talks, I believe that at least hopefully half of all enzymes now are now accessible for time resolve studies, depending on how you tailor your setup for that study. Now the, the setups I showed today are actually quite highly versatile for both uh, use of synchrotrons and XFELs and we're continuing to modify these systems to make them as user-friendly uh, as possible. So we can do both uh, reaction initiation from, with optical excitation as well as diffusion and mixing using uh, the piezo injectors, as well as being highly material efficient. Um, optimally, when everything is running well, we can actually collect quite a lot of data um, per given time. If we do it just classically with our standard serial setup, we can get about one time point per hour. But if we use the burst mode, uh, which I showed you in the previous slide, we can get about 50 time points per hour. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank a few people particularly uh, Eike Schultz, who's um, an equal contributor in, in all the ideas that we put forward uh, for developing our systems, um, as well as the scientific support unit for machine physics at the Max Planck, uh, headed by Fritjof Telkamp, who's a group of highly skilled physicists and engineers, which aid Eike and I for building and developing the tools we use. Uh, thank you. Super.